This is the 125th year since the invention of Jell-O. I bet almost nobody knew I was going there. A man named Pearl Bixby Waite, who was um, sort of a jack of all trades. He was doing some um, construction work and he was doing some sales and selling medical healing snake oil things and sort of an entrepreneur. Um, he got the idea of mixing powdered fruit with a gelatin and sugar and his wife named the creation Jell-O. Well, he thought, I've really hit on something. So he began to try to sell it. And after a few months, the sales were lackluster and he was involved in other things. And he really just became impatient that it didn't go big fast enough. So he found a gentleman by the name of Orator Woodward who agreed to buy the patent for Jell-O for $450. He took the time to invest in the marketing, distribution, the planning, manufacturing, until in eight years, Jell-O had become a $1 million business. Now, that's a lot back then in 1897. Unfortunately, Pearl Waite, who invented it, and his wife who named it, and their offspring, their heirs, never received a penny of the 1.1 million boxes of Jell-O that sell every day over the last, well, I don't know if it's that much over the last 125 years. I never could handle this stuff. It was fun to play with, but I never cared much for Jell-O. The problem was that uh, Pearl Waite couldn't wait. <laughs> and because of his impatience, he lost out. In the New Testament, there's a story, a parable that Jesus shares, especially connected with the theme of the second coming. And here we are, a year closer to that event. And some are wondering, why is it taking so long? Thought it might be a good idea for us to study the ten virgins and Jesus' return. And this will be part one in this study. And it's based on Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. So in your Bibles, I'm going to read through the parable. Go to Matthew 25. And as you're turning, I just want you to note that Matthew 25, the words begin in red letter. And Matthew 24 ends in red letter. There were no chapter divisions. Matthew 25 is a continuation of what we would call the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus is talking about the signs of his coming. So it's all part of that. You'll also notice the very first word is then. That means it's a continuation of something that he was saying prior. So we'll, we'll get better understanding of what the parable is about by also looking at Matthew 24. But let's begin with verse 1, Matthew 25, and we'll read through verse 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to, your, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said assuredly, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Very important parable. It's important to you because you're in the story. 
It's talking about people who profess to believe in Jesus. Some make it, some don't. Some are wise, some are foolish. And um, I don't think any of us want to be in that second category. And so it's important for us to study this. And it's dealing specifically with the time in in which we're living right now. Now, you're only going to find this parable in the book of Matthew. You'll find in Luke chapter 21, chapter 17, excerpts of the Olivet Discourse where he talks about his second coming. You'll find it in Mark chapter 13. But this is the only place this particular parable appears. So there needs to be some explanation as we proceed. By the way, there's an interesting quote from the book Christ Object Lessons, that classic, page 406, where it talks about the parables. He told his disciples the story of the ten virgins, illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. So this is applying to those who live just before the second coming. That's clear enough from the parable and the context. You need to understand something about a Jewish wedding that was uh, very different. And, And I mean a Jewish wedding back in the time of Jesus because they've evolved over the years. In Bible times, in the time of Christ, when two people were going to get married, it was not a quick event. They did not go to an Elvis Presley drive through wedding chapel in Las Vegas. Uh, They would, first of all, it was largely arranged by the parents, but not as much as in India, where the parents might do it without ever consulting the young people. The young people were involved. You can even go to the book of Judges, and you remember where Samson went to his parents and said, I found a girl, get her for me. But notice he had to go through his father. And the both father of the bride and groom are mentioned in the story of Samson because they were integral in arranging the wedding. Part of the reason for that is the groom would have to pay a dowry, and the father of the groom was involved in that. So once there was a decision made that these two would be a good match, the fathers would meet. They'd settle on what the dowry amount would be. And then they would have the first part of the wedding which was separated by as much as a year from the second part of the wedding. It was called the betrothal, the ceremony of the covenant. Listen carefully. So the first part was a covenant. And that's when the families got together and the father would pay the dowry. The bride and the groom would say their commitment. And something you'll still see in a Jewish wedding today is the groom, they would would give him a cup of wine. He would drink it from one cup, she would drink from the cup. Then they would wrap it up and he would crush the cup with his foot, signifying no one else was to drink from that cup. Any of you ever seen this before at a Jewish wedding? Remember where Jesus said, are you able to drink from the cup that I will drink from? A lot of language of a Jewish wedding is in the parables. So after that covenant was made, they didn't run off have a honeymoon. That was the betrothal the covenant. Now he would go and he had to prepare and he would go back to his father's house and he would build a place apart from his parents, but near, usually on the property or nearby. And the Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So this is where the boy would move out and usually on the farm somewhere nearby. He'd build his own home and this could take a while and he'd try to plant his own field and get established and She never knew exactly when he'd be done, but there was usually some warning that was given. Then he would come and retrieve his bride and bring her back to his father's house. And these virgins would meet them. They were the bridesmaids, friends. Uh, They'd go with the bride and they would light the way. They usually did this at night because it was often hot. It was an agricultural society and it was a time of festivity. And so when Jesus is telling this parable, they all understood. Now we need to know more about it just to get the context of what they're talking about. So then he would bring her back to his father's house and then the wedding feast might last as much as seven days. You remember the story of Jacob where they had a wedding feast of seven days and then they finally, he went in to the tent of the, um, or went into the abode of his bride and uh, behold, it was Leah, but that's a whole different sermon. Uh, but it was, and then the father said, well, you will also fulfill the seven days for Rachel and I'll give you both girls. And you remember this feast of Samson? He had a riddle during the seven days of the feast. So it's very common to have between five and seven days in the feast. 
So with that backdrop, you can understand. Uh, you know, I did a little research in preparing for this message, and I was surprised to learn, well, in Bible times, when they got married, typically, uh, the girls got married fairly young. Between 12, 15, they figured that they were marrying age. And um, the boys may be a couple of years older. And we might think that that's just really irresponsible, but what state would you guess has the youngest marrying laws in North America? Massachusetts. It surprised me too. Girls as young as 12 and boys as young as 14. That doesn't happen very often because if the boy happens to be 17 and he marries a girl 12, it's called... Yeah, it's against the law. So... I just thought that was, uh, that was interesting. But they, they would typically get married very young at that time. And um, one thing we'll notice now as we go through the different signs in the parable is you've got the wise virgins and you've got the foolish virgins. First of all, let's look at the number 10. What does that signify? Um, we're not sure exactly. Ten is sort of a perfect number in the Bible. It's one of the numbers that's used, of course, for the Ten Commandments. Uh, Josephus tells us that according to Jewish law, that as the Jews were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, they could not celebrate the Passover unless they had ten people in the community that were Jews. And I read somewhere else that a Jewish wedding needed at least ten people present to have it sufficient witnesses. So while there are 10, I'm not so sure. And then don't make too much out of it that it says there were five wise and five foolish, meaning 50% of professed Christians are lost. I think Jesus divides it down the middle, just like he did where he said, two men are in the field, one is taken, one is left. That's 50-50. Two women grinding, one is taken, one is left. Two men sleeping in a bed, one is taken, one is left. He's just basically saying, you don't know from the outside. They're outwardly doing the same things. Now these girls, they've all got lamps. They all have sacrificed time to come to the wedding. They're probably all wearing similar wedding apparel. And so in every respect, uh, they at least know about the bride and the um, people in the wedding. It looks like they're the same, but there's a difference. We'll find out more about that. So, first let's look at, we're going to be talking about the lamps, what's meant by the oil, what's meant by the, the, um, the virgins. Let's talk about the virgins here. They're the ones who profess a pure faith. Now, the bride of Christ is the church at large through all of time. This is the, the believers that Christ will be married to in, at the end of the 1,000 years. You remember the parable Jesus tells us the illustration in John chapter 14. He said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. We use the word mansions. It's actually dwelling places. I think wedding chambers. So I go to prepare a place for you. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's where he retrieves his bride, takes her back to the wedding. The bride that he has when he comes is all the believers through all time, those who are alive and remain and those who are resurrected. So the, all the believers are there, right? Bring back to the Father's house for this great uh, feast and celebration. And Revelation bears that out as well. You can read that a woman is often symbolized as a church. Jeremiah 6, verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and a delicate woman. You read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, These, the 144,000, are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the saved believers. But it uses the word virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What qualifies the wise virgins? Virgins? <laughs> it's real easy to get mixed up here. I remember when I first started reading the Bible, I thought this was called the King James Virgin. Someone had to correct me on that. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and the Lamb. Now it says five were wise. The word five there is penta. 
And you can, you know, Pentagon, five sides. Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. And so pente means five, and it says they are for nemos. That's the Greek word for wise, and that would mean sensible, wise, good judgment. So five of them are for nemos. And what is this wise? What's the wisdom? What's it talking about when it says they're wise? How are they um, distinct from the others? Psalm 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. There's a woman in Revelation 12 that says she keeps the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus, right? It's got the law and the testimony. And it says here in Psalm 19.7, they are wise. The ones who obey are wise. Jesus said it's a wise man who builds on the rock. Who is he? The one who hears my words and does them. Because the fool hears the words too, but does not do them. So that's one distinction between the wise and the foolish virgins as well. And then it says that five were foolish. And the word foolish there in Greek is moros. And by the way, that's where you get the word moron or moronic. And it means, as you would guess, dull, stupid, empty-headed. A person who is making a totally irresponsible, irrational decision. I mean, you think about it, going to the wedding of the bridegroom at night and not bringing oil for your lamp is like saying, I'm going to go exploring in the dark. I'm going to take my flashlight and not bring any batteries. It's not very smart. And that's what Jesus is saying. Matthew chapter 7, he says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do them, he is the fool. Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient. Who are the foolish? Say it. Disobedient. They know what God wants, but they're not obeying. Deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. So the virgins represent, of course, the church at large, and then you've got the wise and the foolish. These are professed Christians. Who is the bridegroom? Jesus. Are you with me? All right. Just but I want to give you some scripture. Some people, the Bible is new to them, and they don't know this. Luke 5.34 and he said, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? And Jesus is referring to himself. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul said, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Clearly, the virgin presented to Christ who is the bridegroom. So we don't need to wonder about that. Now we get into the lamp. This is a very important part of the parable. What is the lamp? Psalm, and I've got something I'm going to do to illustrate this a little bit and show you. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a what? A lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So let's go ahead. Let's bring out my lamp here. Cue the lamp. Here we go. I'll give you another verse on this. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. It says, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. So what is the lamp? So in Bible times, I want to thank Pastor Ross for lending me his lamp. I saw this on the shelf in his office and asked if I could borrow it. It didn't come with a wick, so I supplied my own wick. But my first experiment totally failed. I took a nylon shoelace, and it would not burn no matter how much I soaked it in oil. And of course, you know what kind of oil I used? Virgin olive oil. And wouldn't that make sense? So this is very much, the, the, we, they get these, when you go to Israel, they'll give you one of the lamps. This is what they use. They're common actually in many parts of the world. And what they do, I finally tore up a t-shirt. Cotton works best. And so it's soaked in oil. And when you wanted to turn it down, like they're going to take a nap, the bridegroom is not coming on time, they'd go like that and they'd let it burn low. And then when they hear the sound, the bridegroom is coming, they'd pull it out and it would brighten up. These are sometimes called torches too. And they had different sizes. And I think for a wedding, they actually used the bigger variety that needed more oil. And of course, the brighter it burns, 
the more oil it uses, right? And this might not seem like much light here in the studio, but if you're on a dark night somewhere, it, it uh, actually pretty good. So we'll let that smolder here. Just wanted you to be able to visualize something about what they were using back then. So these were the lamps they used in Bible times, and they have olive oil inside them to help illuminate them. Psalm 119, verse 130, the entrance of your word gives light. So all of these virgins have a lamp, is that right? What is the lamp? The Bible. Are there a lot of people out there that have Bibles? And that's all you need to be saved. Own a Bible. They all went to the place where they gathered for the wedding. So all you need to do to be saved is gather with other virgins that say they are waiting for the bridegroom. Well, they were all gathered. Were they all saved? Is being a member of the church the only criteria? No. So not only did they need the word, but let me give you more on that. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So what are these virgins supposed to do? They're supposed to illuminate the way for others. They were not just, the lights were not just for them. They were to be the leaders of the bridal party leading a whole group of people to the wedding. So Christians in the church, we're supposed to go out and lead others to Christ the bridegroom. Say amen. amen. Luke 12, verse 35 Jesus admonishes us, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So the lamp is the word of God. What is the oil? It's the spirit, Holy Spirit. Let me give you some verses on that. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. When they would anoint a, a king or a priest, it was a symbol that God was going to give them the spirit in special measure to do the work they had been called to do. Did Jesus receive a special anointing of the Holy Spirit when he began his ministry? Yeah. You can also read in Exodus 30, verse 31. And you will speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. And they were given a formula you'll find in the book of Exodus, where they would make this special anointing oil, and it used what we would call virgin olive oil. It was pure olive oil. And then they added some, I think, myrrh and maybe some frankincense and some other things. And, and uh, they would make this recipe and this oil and all the ingredients had a special symbolism to them. This oil was used to anoint holy things that were set aside for God. So whatever was anointed with this oil was holy. And they weren't to use it for just anything. It anointed all the furniture in the sanctuary with the holy anointing oil. And God wants to anoint us with this oil. The priests, Aaron and his sons, were anointed with the holy anointing oil. He wants us as a nation of kings and priests to be anointed with this oil and filled with the Spirit so the lights will be burning. In the temple, did they have a lamp? They did. Did the lamp burn without the oil? You know why they, uh, the Jews celebrate Hanukkah? Hanukkah goes back, and you won't find Hanukkah in the Bible, but it's in Jewish history. Hanukkah goes back to a time when the Greek kings were forbidding the practice of the Jewish religion, and they had surrounded the people of Israel, and they ran out of oil for the lamp in the temple. But the light did not stop burning. For eight days, it continued to burn until they were able to secure some more oil. And they say it was a miracle that the lamp kept burning. I had a car like that. Once I was praying, I ran out of gas and I prayed and it ran on empty for 70 miles. I, it's a miracle. Either it was a broken gas gauge or a miracle. 
but I'm claiming the miracle. Zechariah 4 speaks about two olive trees that are by the throne of God, one at the right of the bull and the other at the left. The olive trees means it supplied oil. So he answered me, go to verse 6, Zechariah 4, 6. He answered to me and says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. That oil represents the spirit. Now, I got a lamp. Can I throw my Bible at people and make them get saved? Can I just read the Bible and will I automatically be saved? Who wrote the Bible? God did. So you not only need the Word of God, you need the Holy Spirit to understand and to live out the words in the Bible. We need the Spirit more than ever before. First Corinthians 2.11 Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So it's the Spirit of God that makes the Word of God come alive in our lives. Otherwise, you've got a lamp with no light. Are you with me? In Christ Object Lessons, that same book, page 408, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. I know atheists that read the Bible for the sole purpose of arguing they have no intention of believing it. I know a few that were converted doing that because the Holy Spirit spoke to them and they listened. But there's people who read the Bible and they're not converted. They love to argue it. They love to study it for history or whatever. You need the Spirit of God. Now, if you have the Spirit of God and if you've got that light, how will that be shown? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You look in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithness, gentleness, self-control. How do we let our light shine? You read the Word of God. Through the Spirit of God, you live the life of God. And you have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. So right away you see one big difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins is one has a reserve of oil. They are living out the life of Christ in their lives. Well, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm comforted that this is going to be at least a two-part series, so I'm going, to, I'm going to conclude with this thought. It says, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now, does it seem like it's been a long time since uh, Jesus promised he would come quickly? In the last chapter of the Bible, three times he says, behold, I come quickly. That's 2,000 years ago, roughly. What's taking so long? Well, it seems like he's delayed. You notice twice in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and remember, that's one sermon, he talks about an apparent delay. Why? Because it was during the time of delay the difference between the wise and the foolish is seen. The time of delay is a test. Let me give you some scriptures to illustrate that. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, what does tarry mean? It seems to be delayed. Though it tarries, wait for it, wait for it. You ever heard that? George Washington told his soldiers back when it took so long to load a gun, so do not fire until you see the whites of your, their eyes. You cannot waste your ammo shooting because you're scared. You've got to wait until they're close enough to hit the enemy. And that's so hard to do when you're frightened. Wait for it. It will not tarry. It will surely come. So wait a second. He just said, though it tarries, and then he said, it will not tarry. The only way you can understand is though it appears that he's late, he's not late. That's why Jesus told us several times in this parable, no man knows the day or the hour. Let me give you some others. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. The prophet here says, that you might be mindful of the words that were spoken of by the holy prophets, such as Habakkuk, and the commandments of us, the apostles, and the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, where do these scoffers come from? The world? No, the world's always been scoffing. Even within the church, some will scoff and say, yes, he's coming, he's coming. We've been hearing that. Especially church where 
the second coming is embedded in our name. That'd really be a shame. If people have the name Adventist, cease to believe and get excited about an expectancy and an imminence of his coming, oh, then you've really lost the savor in your salt when that happens. Peter said scoffers are going to come walking after their own lusts. Don't mention that. One reason that they're scoffing is because they're walking after their own lusts. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You know, we just uh, came through a holiday where they had, uh, they called it the flight mirror. All these flights were canceled. And there was chaos. Karen and I were kind of flying in the middle of that, but we flew, flew Christmas Day, and so our flight was not canceled. The one coming home was just late. But uh, a lot of folks that were going to the GYC program had to drive because they just could not get another flight. It was a disaster. Usually when you get on a plane and it's a little delayed, and it happened last week, on the way home, the pilot says, we, we are sorry, we apologize that we are leaving late but we've built a delay into the schedule, you will still arrive on time. So even though you're not pulling away from the gate when they say you're supposed to take off, you still land on time because they've built an expected delay into the program. I know that sounds crazy, doesn't it? A scheduled delay. Well, maybe that's what Jesus is talking about. Exodus 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down the mountain, was Moses late? Was he, you know, going slowly down because he was just so old? No, he was right on time. The people were being tested. You see, they had just told the Lord, he had given them the Ten Commandments verbally. They heard the Ten Commandments. They said, all the Lord has said we will do. And so there's a delay. And what happens during that time of delay? They became impatient and they lost the patent on Jello. They made a golden calf, right? During the time of testing, when Moses delayed, they said, Come, let us make gods. We don't know what happened to Moses. He's not coming back. I wonder if God's people would ever say that. 1 Samuel chapter 13 Samuel told King Saul, you're going to go down to battle against the Philistines at Gilgal. Wait for me. After seven days, I will come. You read here in 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him, from Saul. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering to me. And he did something no king was supposed to do or queen. It was only for the priests to offer sacrifice. And he said, oh, the other nations do it, I can do it. He compromised and he offered sacrifice and as he finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel came. Oh, if he had just waited a little longer. But during the delay, during the test, he lost faith. What was the result of that? Samuel said, you've done foolishly. You've got wise virgins and you've got foolish ones, don't you? Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. That separates the wise and the foolish. Which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. He was going to receive an everlasting reward. But now your kingdom will not continue. He lost the crown. He lost the kingdom because he lost patience. He stopped believing the prophet would come. Could that happen again in the last days? Hebrews 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now I'm in the New Testament. Now the just will live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in them. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. You see, at the end of Matthew chapter 24, just before he gives the parable of the ten virgins, he closes with another parable. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord is delaying his coming. Where does he say it? In his heart. But what's in his heart starts showing in his life. 
and he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant, servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here's someone that, they're a servant, they're a professed follower, but they said he's taking so long. You know, it's during the delay, you can sometimes tell when someone loves a person or not. Why hasn't the Lord come yet? Because he loves us. The Bible tells us that he's not willing that any should perish. And you picture a mother on a boat getting ready to leave the dock and her children aren't there yet. She's going to tell the captain, wait, 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 wait. And she'll wait as long as she can persuade the captain to wait because she loves her children. So it's a, really, it's a test of love to see who will endure, who will wait. Friends, we're living in that time now. I think the Lord is coming soon. I believe that we're living in a time where this apparent delay is testing the faith of people. And a lot of folks are doing like the children of Israel and like King Saul in compromising because they're losing faith. We got to hold on. Jesus said, if you're going to put your hand to the plow, do not let go. Hold on. Jesus is coming.